That's some rare footage of Ernest Hemingway on board his boat, the Pilar, off the coast of Key West, Florida. And Key West is where C-SPAN is today as our American Writer Series continues its journey through American history. Today, we're going to focus particularly on the 1920s and 30s through the life and times of this Nobel Prize winning writer with 21 books to his credit. Joining me live from the Ernest Hemingway home in Key West is Hemingway scholar Susan Beagle. Susan, if one wants to study this period of history, why would you turn to Ernest Hemingway? Well, I think it'll, in a lot of ways, Ernest Hemingway almost is the first half of the American 20th century. Um, he's born in 1899, just as this new century is about to begin. And uh, he's of age to come under fire in, in World War I to uh, experience the growth of American literary modernism in Paris. Um, he goes to the Spanish Civil War. He's back under fire in World War II. And as well as being a wonderful writer of fiction, he's also a journalist. So he's traveling the globe to the, the Greco-Turkish War, um, the Sino-Japanese War. He's really a citizen of the world. How did he get to, he to here to Key West? He arrived here in uh, the year 1928. He was returning from Paris with his second wife, Pauline Pfeiffer. She was pregnant um, with their first child, seven months pregnant. And their idea was um, to that they actually took an ocean liner um, from the port of La Rochelle to Cuba, took a ferry from Cuba to Key West, and they were going to pick up a car here. Pauline's very rich Uncle Gus um, was giving them a Model A Ford Coupe that they could then drive to her family home in Arkansas, and the car wasn't ready when they got here. So um, the Ford dealership gave them a little apartment, and they spent six weeks here waiting for that car. And during that time, Hemingway just fell in love with the place. He was writing a farewell to arms. He was getting a lot of work done here. Met some local people who took him out fishing. Um, one of my friends likes to say probably the first time he got a 30-pound tarpon on a, on a two-pound line, he was really hooked into Key West. And um, so after that visit, uh, they kept returning for the next two years. And then in 1931, bought their home here. If you haven't been to Key West, let's give you a little bit of sense of place so you know where we are. If you were to land at the Miami airport and drive about three and a half to four hours, depending the, the, on the traffic, this is truly an island with a seven-mile bridge uh, to cross into it. It is the southernmost point in the United States, and we are about 90 miles away from Cuba. Cuba, an impo important part of Ernest Hemingway's life as well. How come? Um, I think Hemingway's great love in this area is actually the Gulf Stream, which kind of forms a wall uh, between uh, Key West and Cuba. What really, really hooked him into this place was fishing in the Gulf Stream and then watching the trade of these two cultures um, across the stream. When he got here, it was still prohibition. The principal source of the economy in this community was smuggling liquor across the stream into Cuba. Um, the 1930s, we had drastic immigration laws and restrictions in effect. So smuggling aliens across the Gulf Stream um, from Cuba into Key West, also a, a big part of the scene then. And then Cuba itself was locked in revolution. Uh, there was a right-wing military dictator, um, Mercado, in power. There was a growing communist revolt against Mercado, so a lot of revolutionary activity, gun running. Um, it was a very exciting time to be here in Key West. So. He loved the fishing, he loved Hispanic culture, um, he loved the real people here and the kind of hard-boiled life that they led dealing with these, these two cultures in a transitional period. <laughs> in each one of these programs, we're focusing in on a particular work of the writer. In this one, we're dealing with Ernest Hemingway's classic book, The Sun Also Rises. In the modern library list of books at the end of the 20th century, this was number 45 of the most influential novels of the century. For him, which book was it? For uh, Hemingway, it was his first novel. Um, his very first book was a collection of short stories called In Our Time, which uh, absolutely groundbreaking book. One of the things I think we all need to remember about Hemingway is that, in a sense, he really created American literary modernism and brought it into the mainstream. That very simple, uh, streamlined, clear prose that completely overturned all the ornate Victorianism and sentimentality of the 19th century was really uh, created first in that book of short stories in our time and then with the novel which is what really brought him on the scene as a major writer 
um, very famous for its conversation, its dialogue, its introduction of, of lost generation characters. It was published in 1926. That's right. By yes. whom? Uh, by uh, Charles Scribner's sons. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, who had recently published The Great Gatsby, did a great favor for his friend Ernest Hemingway and introduced him to Maxwell Perkins at Scribner as the great editor. So he was a big, a big catch for them and a great start to Hemingway's career to be with Scribner's. Before we leave the spot here, we are uh, just outside Hemingway's home, which is right over our shoulder, and uh, we are right by Route 1. And I want to tell those of you who have not been here, all the millions of us who live in East Coast America are also very familiar with US-1 running all the way from Maine to Florida. Its terminus point is about a block away from where we are, and you are seeing uh, some pictures of that right now. So this is as far as you can go and still be in the United States of America. And this is a, a, a city with about 33,000 permanent residents and lots of tourists. And we're at the height of the tourist season. And uh, this place is open for business today. So you'll see lots of the people who are here visiting Ernest Hemingway's house as we're talking about it. What's important about the American Writers Program is your participation. And in a few minutes, we'll begin taking your telephone calls. And we are going to be talking about his writing. But the writing is in the larger context of what was happening in the country in the 20s and 30s, a very tumultuous time in American history. If you'd like to join us, please do. If you live in the eastern half of the United States, our telephone number is 202-585. 3890-202-585-3890. If you live in the mountain or Pacific time zones, you can reach our Ernest Hemingway program by dialing 202-585-3891. Now, in 1926 in America, when his book came out, tell me about the country and who was reading him. The people who were really enjoying Hemingway were really people um, of his own age group to a certain extent. Which would have been how um, old? That they would be people in their, in their late, late 20s. Um, the, the flappers, um, the young people of that era who had served in, in World War I and become very disillusioned um, with the, the older generation and its values. It was a terribly alienating war. Millions of people dead. Um, really the first huge mechanized conflict in, in world history. Um, so very turned off from the values of their parents, um, the whole make money business culture. Um, a comparable thing I think would be the 1960s um, generation during the, the Vietnam War. Really created lost generation style, a sense of speech, a sense of dress. But he was also immediately embraced um, by the literary community, by the intelligentsia. Um, people actually were collecting his manuscripts in Paris before he was ever published in the United States knowing he was going to be a sensation. You and I are going to take a little walk, okay. and we're going to make our way as the program progresses around some of the grounds of the house here. And, and uh, while we're doing that, tell me a little bit more about his World War I experience. Um, he went to World War I as an ambulance driver with the American Red Cross. Why didn't he serve? He wasn't able to serve. He had very bad eyesight. Couldn't get in uh, to the U.S. Army. And was an ambulance corpsman, and he was very badly wounded in Italy. Um, he was the first American wounded in Italy. He was in a trench when it was hit by a mortar, um, a, kind of like call them a trash can mortar, filled with nails and pieces of uh, metallic garbage. Um, he received over 227 little pieces of shrapnel in his legs, got out of the trench in spite of that to carry a wounded man in the back of the lines, and when he got out was hit twice by machine gun fire. Uh, got a bullet in the knee, a bullet in the foot. Spent a long time recuperating in the hospital um, in Milan. And if you've read Farewell to Arms, this wonderful love story about uh, a wounded ambulance man and a nurse, he had a very similar experience. He met and fell in love with a nurse while he was there. When he finished his wartime recuperation, did he come back to the States or where did he go? He came back to the United States uh, briefly um, to continue a career as a journalist that he had begun before he left. He was a reporter as a young man for the Kansas City Star and the Toronto Star. Um, but he didn't stay here long. He got introductions from Sherwood Anderson to some of the great writers in Paris, um, to Gertrude Stein and Ezra Pound, and he wanted to go over there. So he married Hadley Richardson, had a little trust fund, and off, off they went to Europe to see if he could become a writer. As you and I are standing on the corner of this uh, Ernest Hemingway home here, where it is about 85 degrees, and uh, we have this uh, balmy assignment this afternoon in the tropics, I want to uh, introduce you to another guest who will be with us throughout our program. And she is uh, an expert on the lost generation. Uh, Linda Miller is joining us. She's at a set that's just around the corner from us here under the palm trees. And uh, Linda Miller, at this point, would you just pick up, please, and explain a little bit more about the group called the Lost Generation? Who were they, and what was Ernest Hemingway's role? 
Well, the last generation was probably an expression coined by Gertrude Stein. She told Hemingway uh, during one of his visits to her in her salon in Paris that Hemingway and all of his generation were a lost generation.